watch a shitty show. We watched a well, I can't say that. The the I, this is will never it can never be worse than Thumbs in the Middle because of the ladder match or the, the ultimate match. match. Yes, that was really good. That was awesome. Rest of the show. In fact, even if I cared, this wasn't a terrible show. This was your average impact. There were terrible moments. There were terrible moments. They did the worst job ever of hyping up a pay per view. And they had one of the worst matches I've ever seen on this program. It opened up with Dreamer calling out Raven, and he wanted to know what the hell happened last week. And Raven explained that they known each other for 30 years. He was still upset about Dreamer taking away his girl. He said Dreamer stole his woman, married her, and Dreamer's children should be calling Raven Dad, not Uncle Scotty. Of course, this made Dreamer mad, so... Tommy Dreamer walks up the ramp as Raven is talking. Yes. Raven is just standing on the ramp talking, ranting and raving. Tommy Dreamer walks up the ramp and he punches Raven in the face. Yeah. Raven does not make a move. No. He is an innocent <laughs> he is an innocent promo man punched right in the face. So Dreamer punches him and then uh, Abyss comes out and attacks Dreamer. RVD made the save. Taz nonchalantly mentions this is the main event for tonight because you see they must have put it on the website and they presume that everybody goes to the website me I had absolutely no idea and I've read the spoilers about a dozen times Taz nonchalantly mentions that this is the main event tonight so Raven gives Dreamer a DDT on the ramp and by the way in hindsight Dreamer was completely fine two hours later Foley then came out hit Raven in the stomach with a barbed wire bat and now he'd be the referee for the match at the pay-per-view. Raven also was completely fine two hours later. A man DDT'd onto his fucking head, and a man hit in the abdomen with a barbed wire bat, possibly disemboweling him. Totally fine two hours later. So, this all happens, and then Mike Tanay very nonchalantly says, Wow, let's, let's talk about the show tonight. <laughs> yes. He explained this. As if he'd seen it two dozen times on television. Well. As opposed to a sportscaster seeing it for the first time live. This yeah. out of control action. Yes. Today could not possibly have been calmer. <laughs> it was. Today it, was talking. Imagine if you just saw, like, a riot. A riot involving large men and weapons. And this is happening live on the news. And the newscaster is explaining it in the same way he would explain that we're going to have sunshine tomorrow. It's exactly what this was. Completely nutty. I did like Raven's promo I enjoyed. Uh, even though, even the part where he was standing there talking as Tommy Dreamer approached him to punch him in the face, because Raven's a madman. And so he would go off in his diatribe regardless of the threat of, of, the threat of violence. And more importantly, it led to the payoff line of where he set it up saying, your kid should be calling me daddy. And he vowed after the pay-per-view he was going to cripple Tommy, and then Beulah would be calling him daddy. Yeah, she was going to give her hard justice. Yes. So then Tommy punched him. So then 800 men run in, and it, the, the last run in was Mick Foley hitting Raven in the stomach with the barbed wire, and then announcing himself as the special ref. So you're the special ref, and you're declaring yourself biased against the heel. Raven fighting against the odds at Hardcore Justice. Mm -hmm. Just making sure. Lacey and Velvet against Hamada and Taylor Wilde. <laughs> wow. This was terrible. <laughs> this was so goddamn bad. Lacey has to be the greenest professional wrestler in the entire world in 2010. I, <laughs> and she's one half of the female tag team champion in this was. company. Yeah. It She's is. seen Hamada trying to work with this it was, girl. It was astounding. That, that, exactly. My, my first sentence here. Hamada is wrestling Lacey. So Madison came out on the ramp to watch. Motorcycle chick rode down the aisle. Total WCW here. Ref took a bump in this wretched opener. After he slap. He mm -hmm. was slapped in the face and dropped as if he'd been shot. Motorcycle girl gave Lacey a chair. Madison kicked into her face. And then the ref woke up and counted the pin. Now keep in mind, the ref is counting the pin with a steel chair lying right next to him. Even Taz was, was trying to make sense of this and, and unable to. Which, of course, begs the question, if you do not care at all that a chair was used during this match, why did we even have a ref bump in the opener? I don't know. This was horrendous this, television. It was also very, very long. Lacey worked the entire match. Lacey! 
There was a point where she did a backflip to, for, the express, for the express purpose of missing an elbow smash, and Taz said, and I quote, what the hell was that? <laughs> then she missed another elbow smash, and he goes, ah, just do it again. <laughs> yeah, miss another. <laughs> Taz is out as openly making fun of these matches. And then it... It was, it was horrible, it was overbooked and complicated, and it was also very, very long. This seemed to go on forever, and it was forever of shit. A cock this sucked. A thumbs down. AJ and Rob tear for the TV title. Ref booted Kazarian out. AJ bumped all over the place. And then he bowled the referee into the corner, so he could give Terry a low blow. Pele, 450, it's over. Two matches, two fuck finishes, for those keeping track. Two ref hijinks. Mike Tanay had the temerity... On commentary to claim this TV title could trace his lineage to the 1970s. Astounding. Astounding manipulation of facts. Got a great Kurt Angle video about his march to the top 10. This was actually good. We had a Jay Lethal segment. Jay Lethal's reminiscing about his victory over Ric Flair, talking about beating him, that sort of thing. They're in a street fight tonight. He's sitting in what appears to be the cafeteria like a child. Mm hmm. He had his tray. Probably had the grilled cheese sandwich with a little carton of chocolate milk. Ironically, talking about how Angle had told him he needed to stop being a boy and become a man. Then he declared that tonight he was, and I quote, bringing the man. Yeah. Angelina had killed Lacey. Looked like they're riding her off the show. Good. Wow. Beer Money and the Machine Guns and Ultimate X. Well, first they cut a promo hyping their Ultimate X match, and then they did an Ultimate X match. Why does TNA do that? Is there an answer? No. Okay. They don't know what they're doing. The good news is they had a really good match. Good promo. Good match. Really good match, actually. It was a little bit rushed for TV, but overall, pay-per-view caliber. A couple also, great spots. Shelly went for a sliced bread. Rude flipped him over, and when he landed on his feet, Storm immediately hit the backcracker. That was awesome. Rude took one of the best DDTs of all time. A lot of this is awesome chance. Storm took a sliced bread on the apron. Finally, Rue climbs up the scaffold, and he's holding on to the metal support X while simultaneously walking the rope X, like a tightrope. Saban is swinging to the X from the rope, and he ended up kicking Rude's feet. Rude crotched the ropes, which looked like it fucking sucked, and then he fell into the ring. Which also fucking sucked. And Saban grabbed the X amidst the screams of women. This, on one impact, we saw the best and worst impact segment maybe in years. Yeah, this... This is a really good Ultimate X match. It was also an incredibly safe Ultimate X match, except for the finish uh, where Robert Roode had to walk the high wire and then nut himself and then fall to the mat, and a couple of stupid bumps in the apron. Guys would just get pulled off the cables and land on their feet, and it was fine. It all worked fine. So giant thumbs up to all four of these men. Hogan and Eric came out, and Eric was hyping up the card for next week's pay-per-view caliber impact, which, by the way, Five matches for that show, two matches for the pay-per-view. Actually, at the time this was uh, this was taking place, we had five matches for the free show and one, one. match for the pay-per-view, yes. which was Raven versus Tommy Dreamer, 2010. So they're cutting a promo, hyping up the matches. Out comes Nash. Hogan starts doing the fucking promo about how their time has passed. Time for the guys like Lethal to take yes. us into the next decade. Lethal, by the way. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. And he plugged the machine guns and all the young guys. Just remember that for the end of this segment. Said we need to pass the torch. Says Kevin needs to stop with the politics and the smoke and mirrors. What fucking fan could possibly care about this? I wrote here, they accuse each other of politics that nobody cares about. They started arguing yes. about wrestling politics. Yeah, yeah. What casual wrestling viewer gives a fuck about wrestling politics? None of them. This was the same shit we see every week no. that no one ever cares this about. This was better than the... At least I understood them this week. That's true. That one Jared Nash segment, I still have no idea what the fuck they were talking about. So Nash got upset and shoved Eric. Hogan started punching Nash. Nash gave him a low blow... Second one identical on this show, by the way. Threatened to powerbomb Hogan onto a chair. Then he just stopped. <laughs> Apparently Jeff Jarrett missed his cue, and they didn't edit it. Jarrett finally makes a save, but then out comes Sting. And today noted that Sting was wearing the red Wolfpack face paint. The Wolfpack! 2010! Mm -hmm. 
Lay down Jarrett with the bat. I also like the Sting was standing... Sting, everyone. Standing in the corner. Jeff Jarrett turned around to pick up a chair and didn't notice Sting was there. So he interfered. He uh, saved Nash. And uh, the point of all this, after they had just two minutes earlier been talking about Lethal and the Machine Guns and AJ and whoever, the point of this segment was to build to Hulk Hogan and Jeff Jarrett versus Sting and Kevin Nash. Why? I don't think that was the idea. That's the impression I got. Well. What, what else would it be for? It was Hogan and Jarrett brawling with Sting and Nash. Did I make a massive... I don't think Hogan's wrestling anytime soon. No, well, there's that. Pope and Jordan. What's our fear is a tag match. He's going to stand on the apron the entire time. Orlando was caked in makeup. Looked extremely feminine this evening. Gave his finger a blowjob. Tried to wipe it on Pope. Pope was not down with that. Lots of gay spots. So they're doing their match. Eric Young comes out in the middle and starts putting all of Pope's fake money in his tights. This was so stupid. And somehow it distracted Orlando and the ref. Don't ask me why they cared. I I have no idea. Pope hit the double knees to the back. Four matches, three fuck finishes for those keeping track. Then Matt Morgan hit the ring and attacked Pope to dead silence. Making sure he came off like a geek. Both of them. Mr. Anderson made the save. And then Murphy and Gunner... The security guys came down and told Anderson to get out of there. This show. It's not a good program. The only good thing about this entire segment was when Orlando and Pope were doing chain wrestling, and Taz said, you don't want Orlando behind you. That much I know. Because when you're watching TV... Because he'll put his cock in your ass. That's all what he's trying to say. All you can look for is juvenile fourth grade humor. Mm-hmm. That's, just, that's the best they can offer. Chrissy talking to Flair... She said, if anyone from Fortune interfered in his street fight with Jay Lethal, Flair would be suspended 90 days without pay. So it is a street fight with rules. Yes. Worse, if they're so, in, if they're so worried about interference, why is it not just a cage match? When has a cage and TNA ever stopped anyone from interfering? So This was a great, crazy Flair promo, which he ended with, he threatened Lethal and talked about how great he was and how terrible Lethal was, and then said, tonight you die. Mm-hmm. And then he went, woo, he was happy about the chance to murder Jay Lethal. Flair and Lethal in a street fight. I was greatly entertained by this match, I won't lie. Flair in his custom suit, yes. he wrestled in. <laughs> yes, he came out in a street fight in his suit. Douglas Williams came out to watch. Lethal started tearing his pants off. Flair was standing there at 62 years old, covered in blood, wearing goofy underwear, ended up in one pair of dress socks and one shoe, taking backdrops out of the corner and a superplex off the top. Yes. Finish saw Lethal having the pin, but Williams broke it up. Lethal tried a sunset flip off the top. Flair wouldn't go down, so Lethal pulled his underwear down. Heavy pixelation. Williams hit Lethal with the belt. Flair made the cover. William shoved Lethal's foot off the ropes when he tried putting it on. Flair got the pin. He got his victory back. It's Ric Flair. First off, he shouldn't be doing this shit, but by God, he was entertaining doing it. And he he did such a job during this match that when I read Ric Flair beats Jay Lethal in a street fight, I thought, oh, for fuck's sake. This is the follow-up to Jay Lethal beating Flair with the figure four. Yeah. Flair just gets his win back in a street fight. The way it was done, Jay Lethal looked like he was the man who got fucked. Because Ric Flair knows what the hell he's doing. I enjoyed this. He also did, I counted three flops in this match. Yes. Which may be a record. The he, third one was the best, he, where he took some sort of move, and then he began rapidly walking towards yeah. Jay Lethal. Yes. And Jay Lethal rapidly walked backwards, like, why is this man storming towards me? And then Flair fell down. Yes, they were all pretty spectacular. I, I mean, yes, we can talk. It's, it's obvious how stupid it was for Jay Lethal to lose here, but I, I love the idea that to build a challenger, they had the champion cause him to lose a qualifying match. It makes no sense. To build a champion. Well, they have Doug, a Doug challenger the lose a right? qualifying match. Doug Williams is the champion, right? Yeah. So they, clearly, he's going to be feuding with Lethal now. I guess. To so to start the feud, they had. The champion screw his challenger in an unrelated match when they had no prior issue. That's stupid, Brian. Well, maybe maybe Douglas Williams is going to end up in Fortune. I guess that could be it. That's all I could figure. RVD. That would actually make sense then. 
RVD, well, then, man, he's not going to do it. <laughs> Just be, no explanation for this next week. RVD, goofy promo, and suddenly Jerry Lynn just walked up and said, Sunday we're going to tear it up one more time. Then he walked off, and Christy and RVD looked shocked. And I believe Rob said, that's Jerry Lynn. This was the final build towards the pay-per-view that Sunday. That's how they and made the announcement of the main event. Epic fail. Amazing. It's amazing how stupid they are. RVD and Dreamer against Abyss and Raven. Tommy Dreamer, I might add, despite having no head injuries whatsoever after taking a DDT on the stage, he was wearing tights and boots. Yes. Tights, everyone. He's been wearing track pants his entire career. Now he's got tights and boots. (laughs) So, Raven, of course, none the worse for wear after being hit in the stomach with a barbed wire baseball bat earlier. He uh, runs, uh, well, RBD runs well on him. And, well, walks wild. Raven doesn't move like he used to. Raven looks like Buddy Rose. And I mean the Buddy Rose of 2010. Yeah. Sheamus would laugh at this man's pale skin. So RBD did the hot tag, four way. This is one of those, this is a, a true throwback to ECW in that it started out as a hardcore match. It broke down into a tag team match with legal tags in a polite manner, and then it broke down into a brawl again at the end. So, RVD, of course, pins Raven. Raven, because, of course, that makes absolutely no fucking sense. And didn't have Raven pin Dreamer to set up their scrudge match? Of course not. It went three minutes. Hardly an advertisement for the pay-per-view. Well, and then, speaking of... Then we had bullshit. Oh, yes, we did. So... RVD pinned the guy he's not wrestling, and then out came Abyss. And he beat up both men. Because, you know, RVD will be facing Abyss after the pay-per-view. So Abyss beats up RVD. He beats up Dreamer. Stevie comes down. Abyss beats him up. Mm -hmm. Rhino comes down. Abyss beats him up. So, yes... Abyss is not even on the pay-per-view, and he's beating up everyone who is on the pay-per-view. He is taking that on the is, in fact, a correct statement that I just made right there. He's taking on the entire roster and sub, sub, subduing them single-handedly. So Team 3D came down, but Raven beat them up with a chair, and then the lights went out, and when they came back on, Sandman was in the ring, and he waylaid Abyss and Raven with chair shots to the head. Well, stick and shots. People chanted ECW which Taz claimed was EV2, which was not. And unfortunately, they cut away before we got the shot of Hulk Hogan coming out with the beer to have his beer bash I would with actually, the ECW guys. I would pay to see Hulk, Hulk Hogan drink beer with Sandman before I would pay to watch this pay-per-view. That sounds like a good time right there. Hogan and Sandman chilling. It happened. That's amazing And they me. cut it off the show. What we got instead... Was one last uh, hype video with everyone talking about what ECW meant to them, how important it was to have one more chance to perform for the fans and not to, to keep their legacy alive. And then Bubba Ray Dudley declared that it was probably more important to other people than it was to him. <laughs> so he said, yeah, because they don't give a fuck. <laughs> he does. done this a million times. Yeah. Hell of a preview for the pay-per-view, though. This means a hell of a lot more to other people than it does to me. <laughs> Buy the show! To the back. A lot of people didn't like this show. To me, it was kind of sad. There were a lot of moments on this show where it was sad. Kind of felt like one of those shows where guys should just get out. <laughs> yeah, that is true. There were men in the show who just need to retire and didn't have much to do with weight. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't want guys to die. But let's look at people like, you know, Jim Morrison, the real Jim Morrison, or Kurt Cobain. Guys like this, that are going to be remembered till the end of the time, because they, they, they hit their peak, and then they happen to go away forever. Fortunately, they had to die to do it, but you know what I mean. So mm-hmm. these people are remembered forever. Yes. Can you imagine if, like, Jim Morrison was, was playing in Vegas now, in front of 150 people, how that, sad that would be? That would be cool. That would be real sad. Dennis Leary once said that in 19, I believe it was 1957, someone should, have bullet, should have, someone should have put a bullet in the back of Elvis Presley's brain, so he never, had to, never would have had to deal with Fat Elvis. I don't I don't uh, suggest putting bulls in anyone's head. I don't want to see anybody die. But the point but is, you know, it's good you to know who had a clue best. on this show was Francine. Because she didn't go. They had an interview with Francine, and she said, I'm a mom now. It's been 15 years. I've got a family. 
And this was 15 years ago. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it, but I'm done. This woman knew what she was doing. The rest of these guys, I, I don't. I don't actually blame. You know, some of them are just like, you know, the guys that. To me, it, it's not as bad if you've retired, you've moved on in your life. They call you. You're still in good shape, and you come in for one payday. You go out, come in for a payday. You work first on the card. You have a fun little match. And you go away. Tracy Smothers, for example. You know, it's fine on this show. He's a little fat, but he didn't have much to do, and he did it well. He did nothing well. Is what he did on this show. But the guys are, like, hanging on, and they're hanging on and hanging on. You know what I noticed about this show was, like, Sabu and RVD, that was, and, and Raven and, and Dreamer, those were the two saddest matches on this show. Because, like, the guys in the opener, for example, they danced. They had a dance-off. In the middle of the match. They had a dance-off, for example. And, and well, They did we'll nothing. It, yes. They did nothing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So it was like you could have fun watching it. Kid Cash they, they and dive on like nine men. Yeah. They, they weren't... It, it's sad when you can't do it anymore and you really try to. Mm-hmm. When you can't do it anymore and you don't try, you just go out there and, and go through your comedy spots. like those, those all Japan matches where they, the guys move down and, you know, Aijin had his spit spot and everything like that. Those guys, great. Go out there and and have a little fun. You know, you're not trying to do what you used to do. You're not pathetic. You're just out there just having fun. I'm fine with that. It was sad to see the guys going out there. They can't do what they used to do. They're really trying to do it, and they can't. Like Ric Flair and and Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania. That match was sad. Because Flair tried to go out there and have, like, a five-star match. Didn't work. And the best he could get was three stars. Mm -hmm. Whereas the match on Impact, Flair went out there. He... Bled. Yes. He took a bu- did a bunch of fi- uh, flare flops. It was all wacky. He was in his underwear taking a superplex. Okay, that was not nearly as sad as the Shawn Michaels match. In fact, I was greatly entertained by that match. So there were things on this show that were sad, but unlike your average TNA pay per view, there really weren't any storylines. There was in the Raven Dreamer match. I don't know what the fuck they were doing there. It, 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 by the time the match ended, it was okay, but it was rough, rough waters there in the middle of that match when they started doing stuff. But, like, there weren't a bunch of nonsensical, goofy angles. There wasn't a lot of TNA shit on this show. That is true. I would rather see average matches with guys trying real hard than real great workers having handcuffed blow-up dolls thrown into their matches. Yes. That's just the way I am. If you disagree, great! Everybody has their own opinion of what wrestling should be. But to me, I did not hate this pay-per-view at all because I thought everyone tried real hard. It was kind of sad. You know, some of the guys, I, I hated to see some of the stuff that was done on the show, which we can talk about here in a second. But as far as, like, the usual TNA bullshit, we didn't have any here, and I, I found that to be a positive. When the show ended, little made me angry. There was one match, actually, that did, but we'll get to that. But it, it was more the tastelessness of it than uh, rampant stupidity or yeah. or complete illogic or just, I don't know. The, the usual TNA bullshit, I think, is what you said. We had a lot of stuff here. We had Taz opening up the show saying... Nothing. Nothing, really. Well, yeah. he got the fans to chant, fuck the haters, which was funny. <laughs> he did that. But basically, this was... Uh, an admission that they realized they had a three-hour pay-per-view to kill and didn't have that much time. So, Taz, go cut a promo. He cut a good promo. Sure. He cut a great promo. He said that, yes, he, he talked about the haters who thought that ECW was just about blood and violence, and he talked about how it was all about all this other stuff and told everyone to kiss his ass. I don't know who these haters were. <laughs> I don't either. Did I miss an impact where they all came out and buried ECW? I, well, maybe he's talking about Eric Bischoff, actually. <laughs> actually, that could be it. FBI against Kid Cash, Simon Diamond, and Johnny Swinger. Tracy fucking Smothers was here, everybody. He as I had asked. The man. Yeah. He was great. God, he was great here. He did nothing, like I said, and he did nothing well. That's all I asked for. They had a match. Let's see what we had here. We had uh, Tony Mamaluke is now... Tony Luke? Tony Luke. They Little, couldn't call him Mama Luke. Little Guido is Guido Meritato. Although, uh, Tanae did call him Little Guido on a couple of occasions. Well, there was a point early on here when Tanae explained, there are names and initials that we are not allowed to use. But you all know who these people are. And then later in the exact same sentence, it said ECW. <laughs> yeah. They're, they had some moments on the show. They did certainly have some moments. Um, yeah. 
I realize the big issue in WCW is when they went on the WCW hotline and they talked about how these guys are WWF invaders. You can't do that. But there was the issue of, of WCW saying that, you know, you, you uh, we all know who these guys are, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's essentially what they said here. You know who all these guys are on this show. We just can't call them by those names. Maybe that's okay legally. I don't know. But it seemed to be pushing the issue here. Well, it would, I think it, it seems to me like it would be okay. And it would be like saying, factually, these men used to wrestle for a company that was called Extreme Championship Wrestling. No, they said that a lot. Yeah, and that, 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 that's, that's true. I, I don't think you can use the advertising. The issue is, when you've seen Balls Mahoney wrestle for 15 years, and you're supposed to call them cojones, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard not to call them balls. And a match, two stars, came off like an indie match, but it was fun. I had no problem with it. Simon, Di- uh, yeah, Simon Diamond was fat, so was Tracy Smothers, but as Taz noted, Simon looked like three diamonds. Yes. Because he was fat. So they decided to have the dance off here, and Kid Cash was having nothing to do with it. He was too cool for it. So Swinger and uh, Diamond did some dancing, and it was horrible. And then Tracy, Tracy Smothers grabbed the mic and said, if they can't do better than that, straight up, everybody dies. That's what he said. <laughs> I was sort of hoping they would do worse then. I was glad they didn't <laughs> on this show. But, um, Tracy's yeah. mothers may have saved lives here with yeah. his dance-off. So they won the dance-off, and there was, frankly, the, the usual ECW opening match wackiness where the 600-pound bodyguard gets in and does spots and no one cares, and then Kid Cash, as I said, did a dive on the eight-man at ringside. And uh, they did a bunch of wrestling. Everyone hit a finisher, and in the end, Guido pinned Simon with the unprettier. They talked about the announcing position, and Taz said, "Today, you know, you were never in ECW." And Tanae said, "Well, if Joey Styles were here, I'd give him my spot in an instant." And he said, "I was a real big fan. I hope I do all right tonight." Talked about Jerry Lynn being injured, turning a negative into a positive, which they didn't do, by the way. <laughs> Sabu and RVD was not, in fact, better than Lynn and RVD would have been, but. We had some Where Are They Nows with Gary Wolf, Todd Gordon, and the Blue Meanie. And they all... I didn't like this in the sense that they they all like got interviewed, but they didn't just let every interview play all the way through. Right. They played like 20 seconds, then they did the other guy, then the other guy, then they went back to the first guy, and they went through that like three times. Mm-hmm. I would just like to have seen everybody say their thing. Yeah, I, well, this was newsworthy because Gary Wolf, the pit bull, was here and he identified himself and... It proves he is still alive, which is surprising because there there is a well, it's a little surprising, but there is one of the Raven Sandman shoot interviews where they can't remember if both pit bulls are dead or not. Yeah. So there you go, everyone. 2010, Gary Wolf still alive. Gary Wolf was in character. Gordon Blue Meanie were not. Well, I mean, Blue Meanie was the Blue Meanie, uh, he's but Blue he Meanie. cut his promo as as Brian Heffern. So he, yes, he thanked all the fans and it was very he it was very sweet. He thanked yes. all the boys and all that. And Gordon was talking about how this is the office where it all happened and. Wolf pulled up in his hot rod yeah. with an actual pit bull in the passenger seat yeah. and cut a promo, and he said, this is not the last time you'll see the pit bull. I bet it is. <laughs> I bet this is the last time I'll ever see him. Doubtful. You never know. Al Snow talking ahead. The Blue World Order came in. Apparently, the real Blue Meanie was asked to do the show, but he could not do it. That's why they got a fake Blue Meanie. Because I knew he didn't do the show, and then I was wondering, why the fuck is there a fake Blue Meanie? And at first, my, my first thought was, okay, it's the fat security guard, he must be working for free. And they were so cheap that they thought they could paint this guy up and not have to re- bring in the real meanie. Interesting theory. But that was not what happened. But anyway, there was also a fake raven. Someone's iPhone went off during this segment. I have no idea what happened here. It was lame. A fake raven, I, from having read several online reports, apparently... In the original ECW, in Philadelphia, in the 90s, Raven, at some point, had a lackey in his crew named Lupus. He has not been seen in more than a dozen years, and he showed up on this program, and was not identified, and only Dave Meltzer had a clue who he was. Wow. No one? I didn't know? You didn't know? Wade Keller didn't know? No one in Wade Keller's staff knew? I thought they mentioned a name later on. They definitely did. I'll... I'll, uh... Yeah. But let me find it here. This Lucas. Or maybe it was Lupus. Yeah. Because that, that it would be more fitting. Either but, way, yeah. this is the most obscure cameo maybe in wrestling history. RVD and Fonzie had a meeting backstage. Bill Alfonso used to look 100 years old, and he only looks 150 now, which actually I was shocked by. And they did an incoherent interview, and it was something else. 
And Fonzie said he was going to be both the referee, he was going to be the manager of both men at the same time tonight. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, this guy's fucked up. But as it turned out, he did, in fact, manage both men. Yes. He was correct. He was he was unbiased. Stevie Richards and B.J. Polacco. You have skipped some stuff here. We had the CW oh, yeah. and Scorpio match. Totally forgot about that. Well, it's forgettable, honestly. Well, we had also the, the TNA guys giving their memories of ECW. They did this throughout the show. And some of the guys, like... Jesse Neal and Chris Saban, they were really good because you could tell they were huge ECW because fans. Because what they were saying was at least close to the truth. You could tell. And, yeah. But then we had, like, AJ Styles, who... He described an angle that had been described to him that he had never seen before. Talked about Tommy Dreamer being a legend, so he yeah. knows who may get the book next. And the best one was when they interviewed Madison Rain. She kept calling it the Philadelphia-based <laughs> wrestling promotion. Yes. And... The best part about Madison Rain doing this, and Brutus Magnus as well, they were both 11. Right. And barely legal. <laughs> so They were, in fact, not legal. Yeah. They're barely legal. Yeah, so they, they, they put these in bundles, like the Where Are They Now segments, and that one in particular with Madison Rain, Matt Morgan, and Mr. Anderson. Apparently, Anderson had no idea what he was talking about. No, but... that uh, It was like a different agent directed each little bundle, because this one in particular... They emphasized the term, the Philadelphia promotion, over and over and over again. And Anderson recalled it, that's company, that's Philadelphia-based wrestling promotion. And you know what? I laughed every time. They could have done this a dozen times. I would have laughed a dozen times. Two Cold Scorpio and C.W. Anderson, star and a half. They tried. Scorpio actually did his flip at the end. Scorpio, can he can hit his spots. He's... He's much older. He's better. actually claimed he was better now than he was during his prime. That's a lie. Mm. A flagrant lie. <laughs> but he was fine here. They they were fine. It was it was I was not offended by this match. They no. did the best they could. Right. And they, they, they did not insult our intelligence with anything. So then we had the Madison Rain stuff. R V D and Fonzie, we talked about that. Yeah. Stevie Richards and the former Just Incredible. They called him PJ Polacco. Everyone chanted Just Incredible. We had the fake blue meanie. It was the fat security guard. They called him the blue Tilly. The best actual wrestling match on the show up until this point. Basic, basic. They, they had an indie wrestling match. Yep. They, they told a good story. They, they, they didn't screw anything up. Nothing looked horrible, but almost everything could have been done better. Could you have even imagined that the TNA ECW show in 2010 managed to not have a single you fucked up chant? I am astounded. <laughs> I am completely astounded, to be honest with you. But ended up with Stevie hitting the super kick out of nowhere for the pin. Two and a half stars. It was it was actually not bad. I like Dave's right up on that because Pizza Palaka was winning on him. And uh, then he began to do his catchphrase, which ends with, that's just incredible. And he got as far as, that's Justin. And then Stevie saved him yes. from a lawsuit by kicking him in the mouth and pinning him. Yeah, It was fine. Palaka gave him a cane shot to the back afterwards, beat him up. Then the lights went out. Sandman appeared. He beat He's up Polacco. He was very heavy. And the fact that this was all he did tells you something about the state of the Sandman these days. Also true. Not good times. Yes. Yeah. Uh, here's where we have the videos of Francine. She actually looks much healthier. Yeah. Having gone out of wrestling, so good for her. She also said she wanted to thank the fans, whether they cheered her or booed her. They were always there for her. Right. All those fans who called her a crack whore. Yeah. Over and over again. Yeah. So then Taz told the story about Francine. The story was, one time the Eliminators hit her with total elimination and hit her really hard. And she took it like a man, he said. That was the story. Yeah. So then they honored and acknowledged dead people. They, uh, they wanted to take a moment to recognize those who are no longer with us. And they put up the most poorly written, grammatically incorrect, generic funereal tribute ever. This is an obvious statement, but I don't want anyone associated with TNA putting together my funeral when my time comes. Yeah. Luckily for you, that's unlikely to happen. <laughs> Very unlikely. And I had better outlive them. I was going to say, if you don't outlive them, Vinny, that's you may want to go for, to the doctor tomorrow. That sucks for beyond the obvious reasons. Al Snow... That actually would really piss me off if I died first. <laughs> TNA. Al Snow, Brother Runt, and Rhino, they had a basic three-way match. They said that it was... It was not first pinfall wins, they said. It is an elimination match. At which point they proceeded to do the first elimination when Runt pinned Snow, and then Rhino immediately, like within three seconds, yes. 
scored runs for the pin. Why they needed elimination if they were going to do the elimination within five seconds, I have absolutely no idea. And but that's what they did. Two and a half stars. Yes, a three-way match only got like four minutes in the show because TNA can't do anything right. It was fine. Uh, the, the, there was a, f- a funny comedy moment where Taz started to tell a story about Brother Run, and suddenly the audio went out for like eight seconds. Mm-hmm. And when I said the audio went out, the ring, the uh, announcers, the fans, just the broadcast went quiet. Mm-hmm. And then it came back, and Taz was still talking, and he's got as far as EC, and then he stopped himself. Yeah. So apparently he went over the line at this moment. We had Axel Rotten and Cajones, who was Balls Mahoney, against Team 3D with Joel Gertner, who made the show worth it by himself. He looked about, what do you say, 800 pounds? <laughs> I don't know. He looked like Joel Gertner. He looked. I like don't want to see skinny Joel Gertner. Real big Joel Gertner. He looked big. He looked sweaty. He looked sleazy. He looked disgusting, and that made it all better. He was Joel Gertner like you've never seen. <laughs> yes. Before. The older he gets, the better he gets. The better the gimmick gets, to be honest with you. So, Bubba wanted a Philly street fight here in Orlando at Disney. That's what they did. They, they, did, a, they did a Disney street fight, in fact. There were lightsabers involved. <laughs> They had, yeah, listen, everyone, if you didn't see this, it's not an exaggeration. They used toy lightsabers, and mm-hmm. I don't mean they, like, grabbed a toy lightsaber and hit each other in the head with it as hard as they could. No. They had a choreographed lightsaber they fight. They had a duel. Yeah. The, the, the balls appeared in the ring with a toy lightsaber. Bubba looked at him in fear until Devon tossed him a lightsaber as well. The fans chanted, use the force. Yeah. They swung lightsabers at each other. And then to the spot where uh, the, the lightsabers cross, and they are both pushing, trying to get an advantage. And then Balls ran him through. Mm-hmm. He stuck the uh, lightsaber under Bubba's armpit, and from these, and they switched to a side camera angle, so it appeared Bubba had been impaled. Yeah. And Bubba cried out in pain. And Bubba this, sold it. This was the fakest wrestling match I've ever seen on pay-per-view. Well, he sold it and, and lulled Balls into a false sense of security, at which point he low-blowed him with his lightsaber. Right. Which never happened in Star Wars, by the way, because that would have been recall, a messy scene. I don't recall any nut shots in Star Wars, no. Messy. Yes, they, they also, they, they, they used chairs, but it was very safe. They used cookie sheets, which are much safer anyway. They used a lot of styrofoam heads. These men were having a street fight in a manner that their only goal was to not get hurt. Yeah. And to expose the business as much as possible. Now, we did have two hard chair shots. And amazingly, the hard chair shots were delivered by Bubba and Devon. Of course. Well, What do you mean, of course? Well, be, hey. Miles Mahoney swung the lightest chair shot you've ever seen. Yeah. So, for those of you wondering, if anybody learned anything, Miles Mahoney has learned something. Yeah. And Devon did not take a single shot to the head. He's learned something. Axel stayed the fuck away for the most part. Now, the one guy that has not learned a fucking thing, is Bubba Ray Dudley. He took chair shots to the head. He took a sink to the head repeatedly. He took every shot to the head you could possibly give a man because he's not very smart. 2010, and this fucker is taking hard shots to the head. So if anyone was a moron in this match, it was him. That's fair. And he also swung it hard. He did do that, So too. he's an idiot and a dick. Why? I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Perhaps he Don't th- do this, people. Perhaps he thinks he knows better than doctors. He doesn't, okay? I know. He doesn't, everybody. You don't know better than the doctors. Morons. So. What an idiot. Yes. So they had this match. Retweet that, everybody. That you called him an idiot? Yeah. Yeah, okay. The, uh, the Dudleys won. They powerbomb balls through a flaming table. It was actually, even the fire spot was the safest ever, as it had almost entirely gone out by the time he went through it. And they pinned him. Bubba Ray then declared that they were the greatest tag team in the world, at which point the gangsters came out. Yeah, for real. Mustafa and New Jack. Mm-hmm. I was not expecting this. They came out with weapons. They hit a bunch of funny weapon shots. The highlight was, I believe it was Mustafa hit Bubba with a cane to the back. And Bubba sold this by jumping in circles as high as he possibly could with his arms straight down into his sides. This made Shawn Michaels selling against Hulk Hogan at SummerSlam. Looked like uh, Anderson Silva selling against Kale Kale Sonnen last night. Yeah. This exposed the business more than anything he did in the actual street fight. This was faker than the lightsabers. Yeah. And I demand an animated gif. Gardner got in the ring and Jack killed him with a guitar shot. And then the six men all hugged each other. Yeah. Because they had a fake match and it was fun. 
And the fans chanted, thank you. And the fans chanted, thank you. It was a strange show, everyone. And and it's a good thing this show was not held in like 1997 because New Jack, I guarantee you, would have jumped off the rafters on somebody. Dreamer did a promo, and I think he was trying to say that, or Raven did the promo, I think he was trying to say Dreamer was had, had wallowed in obscurity, but it sounded like he said that Tommy Dreamer had waddled in obscurity. <laughs> he did that too. Which, which actually was a, a significantly better line. Said Dreamer broke his heart, he was going to break his soul, it was good stuff. I the, I was just mystified because there was a point, His his the point of this was that they, they were childhood friends and Dreamer was the one who always took care of him, looked after him, and he was the, the pretty boy. And he, at one point he said, I was never very athletic, but Tommy was a great athlete. Bullshit. I call bullshit on this. Dreamer Raven, no holds barred, Foley is ref. The finish was fine. In fact, the finish was almost pretty good. The rest of this match. First off, Foley being involved in this was just sad. This is Mick Foley, who used to be the hardcore legend. Now, he's an old guy hanging on in TNA. It's sad. It's time for him to just go home and be remembered for what he used to be. Him involved in this match was sad. Then they had every street fight you've ever seen or every hardcore match. Tommy fucking Dreamer. Let's talk about this, man. God bless the guy. No. Fuck him. (laughs) Listen, everyone. Listen. I say God bless the guy because something's got to be wrong with him. Yes, he, that I agree with. Cannot be like a... He, he is a man I feel to be pitied, perhaps. Because because a man... Like a normal man would not do what he That's did in this. Correct. Okay. That is certainly true. Listen, everyone. He brought his wife and his two buggers down to the ring. Two little girls. Very young baby girls. They're sitting there in the front row. Tommy Dreamer proceeds to get his ass whipped right in front of his baby daughters. He cuts his head. Yes. He's bleeding all over. They're freaking out, and they finally had to take the girls away. Yeah. If I ever do something like that... What the fuck is wrong with this guy? Kill me. (laughs) Deal. I accept. (laughs) Well, you don't have to worry about it. I Because I won't do it. And if I do, something's wrong with me. And you, you should be killed. I mean, did no one learn anything? Okay. Beyond the Mat came out in 1999. I was going to say, this is over a decade ago. Yes. Over a decade ago. That just astounds me. Astounds what me. What the hell is wrong with you that you think this is a good idea? You know what my daughters need? My daughters need to see my blood. <laughs> Three feet from their face. My daughters need to see Uncle Scotty beating the fuck out of me and, and biting my head and causing blood to gush out. That is going... Yeah. They're going to grow up fine. Visions like that in their head every night. These are not if they were if they were like nine year old boys, very no. different. No. <laughs> nine year old boys? Well it's like that kind Did of thing. Did even Cliffy to see this? Yeah, maybe not Cliff. Cliffy but, let me tell you a story about Cliffy. Cliffy was on the way to the wedding on the ferry. Mm-hmm. And apparently there was some water on deck. Panic. Thought the Cliff, boat was sinking. Cliff would be a bad He's choice. He's nine. Yes. Okay? Can you imagine if Cliff were in the front row and Tony was out there bleeding like a stuck pig all over as I beat the fuck out of his dad? Right, Cliff is a bad example. Like, it again! I, I, it's just... all, no kid wants to see this. So this was utter bullshit. I don't want to even hear anybody saying, Brian, don't judge how Tony or Tommy Dreamer raises his kids. I will! Do not subject your fucking kids to you bleeding all over in front of them. They don't get it. They don't get it. I've been coaching for... How long has it been now? I was 14 when I first started coaching. I don't have kids, okay? But I've coached kids since I was 14 years old. I'm 35 now. How many years have that been? 21? Mm-hmm. I've been around kids for 21 fucking years, okay? Kids don't get it. It doesn't matter how many times you tell them it's fake, and me and Uncle Scotty are just playing around. They don't get it. Don't bleed in front of your kids. Uh, it just pissed me off. It was it was complete and utter bullshit. It pissed me off. It was nauseating bullshit. It was, you know, <laughs> there's a thing where you said about telling kids it's fake. There's a reason you don't let, watch, let, let kids watch horror movies, for example. And I was over, it was, I was at a family gathering once, and my niece, who would have been like six or seven, not a little younger than that, four or five at the time, she walked in, and one of the Lord of the Rings movies was, was on, and it was the part with the giant spider. Yeah. And, uh,. She looks at the giant spider on the television screen, terrifying the hobbits, and she says, 
That's just pretend, right? But she said in a way it was clear she didn't really think it was pretend. Yes. It's the same reason you don't bleed in front of your kids. So anyway. So they, on top of it, they had a long, boring match. Yeah. It was too... There was a point here we were eating our cake. And we're dining on our cake, stuffing our faces, and Brian says, what a couple of porkers. <laughs> and I thought, yes. And I said, yes, and they're old, too. Because I didn't think he was talking about us. You didn't say they. You said, and old, too. And old, too. So I still thought you were talking about us. Well, yes. But no, I was referring to Tommy Dreamer and Raven. <laughs> we were a couple of porkers, and we are old. They were older and arguably fatter. Fatter than you. Certainly fatter than me. Certainly fatter than you. I don't know about you. So, yeah, that was the... Uh, you know, they were fatter than us. <laughs> they were fatter you're, than you're us. You're steering the average. That is true. So, anyway, Dreamer got handcuffed. Mula did a run-in. Low blowed Raven. Uh, Dreamer managed to give him a DDT while handcuffed. It actually would have been a really good finish. And, of course, Raven kicked out. And then eventually he ddt Dreamer onto a chair for the pin. And really, to be honest, it should have happened. Tommy Dreamer shouldn't have won this match. No, it, it's Tommy Dreamer and Raven. Tommy Dreamer must never win in the end. Yeah. So that was that. It did come off like it's a bad example, but just as an example. Hogan Warrior in WCW, where they were so big and they were so popular, and then they came back in WCW and nobody gave a fuck. Yeah. We then had Jeremy Borash and SoCal Val plugging whatever when the gangsters interrupted. <laughs> This was the best thing. Oh, my show. God, this is awesome. New Jack referred to SoCal Val, just said, what's up, little white girl? Yes. And uh, they determined, somehow was determined that she would go with uh, Mustafa. Well, when New Jack first says, hey, white girl, you know what they say about black guys? And SoCal Val is young, and she did not know what they said about black guys. And so New Jack explained, once you go black, you get bad credit. And New Mustafa, Jack said that, everyone. Yes. <laughs> don't, don't blame us. I'm just telling you what he said. Right. And Mustafa dragged her off, and then New Jack is standing there face-to-face with Jeremy Borash. And Borash gives him the bug eyes, and New Jack calmly says, it's just you and me now. And Borash says, yeah. And New Jack says, so, you know what that makes you? And Borash said, what does that make me? And New Jack calmly says, my bitch, come with me. <laughs> and he took Jeremy Borash away to anally rape him. Yeah. Died. <laughs> I great, died. Great comedy. I'm really sad that the New Jack cut that promo on me that one time. It actually wasn't even me that he was mad at, but I think he got confused. I'm a huge fan of New Jack. It don't happen. He's a crazy man. Yes. He's a crazy man. Guys, I'll put over Polly Earlier, they'd all put over... Uh, Joey Styles, which was mind-boggling on this show. I, I realize he was a very, very important part of ECW, but... Talk about how great John Cena is while you're at it. Yeah. So, then we had RVD and Sabu. We talked about this. It was... They tried hard. Sabu, I gave it two and a quarter stars. Yeah. The best thing I can say about this is that I watched the match, and most of the match was boring. But then it ended, and they did a highlight reel. The highlight reel of the match was phenomenal. I was just amazed that Sabu fucked up less spots here than he yes. did in 1996. Sabu has improved since ECW closed up shop. Yeah. So, yeah. The, the, uh, in between, it was better in highlight form is yes. the best way to put yes. it. Yes. In between their highlight spots, there was just a bunch of nothing. There was no heel. There was no face. There was no comeback. There was no momentum. They just did a bunch of stuff. And some of the stuff was really, really cool. I think Dave said they went a long time. Uh, my notes here read they went about 19 hours too long. Yeah. My, the, the highlight of this was there's one point where they did a double down. Both guys were just down selling. Complete silence in the building. No one cared. And then one guy started a this is awesome chant. <laughs> yeah. this, this is a lie. It's, it's yeah. not awesome when the building's quiet, everybody. That's not awesome. So RVD pinned him out of nowhere with the frog splash. Two and a quarter stars. They worked hard. It was fine. And then RVD wanted a handshake. Sabu wasn't going to give it to him, but then he changed his mind and gave him a hug. All the guys came out for a beer ba- uh, beer bash. Fans chanted, fuck you, Vince. Dixie was in the front row with beer, smiling. Dreamer did a promo thanking Taz, Tanae, Atlas Security, the fans, the viewers. And, of course, we could not have done this without Dixie Carter. So the fans chanted, thank you, Dixie. Bubba carried her around ringside. And the show ended with Bubba Ray Dudley throwing Dixie Carter into the middle of all the ECW guys. Thank God the show went off the air at that point. <laughs> Nothing good could have happened after that. Yes. And uh, 
how this builds in the future for TNA? It doesn't. No. They talked about the show on Thursday a little bit, the Rob Van Dam into this match. They plugged Mountain for Glory, which is in October, two pay-per-views from now. And that's it. Other than that, they got no long-term benefit from whatever new audience they may have gotten here. To the back! Let me talk about TNA. All right. I'm taking over on this show. Uh, where to begin? Listen, I've been fine with TNA for a long time because I stopped caring. I watch the show. I don't give a fuck. I laugh at the stupidity. I make Lance watch it, and then I laugh. Well, I, I actually felt bad when he couldn't sleep the night before my wedding. <laughs> Because I, I realize I'm cackling about it right now, but I, I did feel bad that, that, that these lengths that that uh, that this this uh, what's the term that the 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 the, uh, uh, the result had been something so so sad that he I, could not sleep. I did. The, I thought he'd just watch it and get mad, and then everything would be fine. Instead, he actually could not sleep because of this show. The, the, so I felt bad about that. Dave, the night uh, yeah, the night before the wedding, we had to get together at the buffet, and uh, I heard. From yourself, from Lance, from Dave Meltzer, from Todd Martin, and others, everyone said, you know, did you see Impact last night? And the other person would roll their eyes and groan. And this was a show I had not seen. And every time someone bitched about it, I felt a euphoria flow over me. <laughs> this is an Impact I escaped. I felt it was an accomplishment. I don't care anymore. I just don't care. And then, of course, we have this show where everybody talks about, oh, this is a great show. It's pay-per-view caliber show. It's all wrestling and no talking, which, by the way, ended up being a lie. It's just, uh, it's, it's, it's awesome. And so, like an idiot, like a fucking moron, <laughs> I got excited. I was like, oh, we're actually going to see a good impact tonight. There's going to be some great stuff here. So anyway, the show opens up with Angle and AJ. This actually was a good match. AJ debuted his new tattoo. It's ridiculous. A giant A and a giant J on his, on his side. And I'm, I mean, th- the letter A is the size of his head. The letter J is the size of his ass. Right there on the side of his body. His kid's name. That's all nice and all, but this tattoo. So they have a match. It's uh, it a good. match. It's rushed. It yeah. is not. I could not call this a pay-per-view caliber match. They had a pay-per-view caliber match, and they cut out ten minutes. Yes. And that's what we got right here. It was very, very good for the time they were in there, and they had a fantastic finish. There were some good finishes on the show, I'll say that. The finish was the ref got bowled into the corner. AJ tried to give Angle an illegal mule kick. Angle grabbed his leg, put him in the ankle lock, scissored it for the submission. This was awesome. So the show opened with a thumbs up. There's also a great spot here where AJ ran into the corner, Angle ran after him, after him, and AJ did the handstand and popped him in the middle. And so Kurt responded by running up the buckles and hitting a moonsault body press. Mm-hmm. Which I think is a brand new move for him. I think I've seen, with maybe like, maybe five exceptions, I think I've seen every single televised WWE or TNA match Kurt Angle has ever had in his life. I never saw that move. Yeah. That was pretty cool. We had Angelina and Madison for the Knockouts title. This was when the show went to shit. <laughs> Quickly. So first off, I was amused by Angelina getting in the ring, and she's rubbing her vagina on the rope, bending over, showing her ass. She gets in the ring. Then out comes Madison Rain. She bends over, she rubs her vagina on the rope, and they cut to a shot of Angelina who is looking at Madison Rain with such contempt as if to say, look at that fucking slut. I just died. I just died for some reason when I saw that. So Angelina is making her comeback in what has been an average match by TNA women's standards, and suddenly out comes the mysterious biker. So... The biker comes out, and Velvet rushes in and hits her from behind. Velvet then proceeds to try to rip the helmet off. Meanwhile, for those of you that have been in wrestling for, I don't know, three weeks, when shit happens outside the ring, the guys in the ring usually, like, do a chin lock. Or just lie there. Or, or, or something. They, they, essentially, they do nothing. Because you're supposed to be watching what's happening outside the ring. Instead... <laughs> Velvet attacks the biker girl, Mm -hmm. and I had to rewind it to find out what actually happened. What happened was, as she's attacking the biker girl... At the exact same time. At the exact same moment, I think it was Madison hit Angelina with the belt, or maybe vice versa. I don't even remember. All I know is, 
There was a belt shot behind the ref's back at the exact same moment we were focused on Velvet attacking the motorcycle girl. The key is Mike Tanay screamed, Wait! What happened in the ring? Fucking great question! So, all this shit's going on at the same time. Mike Tanay says, and I quote, It's difficult to watch the action in the ring at the same time. That's mm-hmm. why it's called the professor. That's why it's called the professor. So then they focus on the floor, where by the, by now Velvet had removed the motorcycle helmet, but the rider still had a mask on. And then nothing happened. I guess she just rode her bike away. Angelina just got the pin. Yeah, and I that, don't know how. Before that happened, Mike uh, mentioned, and this is also a direct quote: "Back to the title match now." Yes, yeah. back to the championship encounter. So yes, Angelina won with a move to begin what I believe is her forty forty seventh title reign. Fucking disaster this was. And it was rushed. This sucked. Then we got another shitty match. Pope, Mr. Anderson, and Matt Morgan. This is TNA at its finest. Okay, you got to do a three-way. Now, in 2010, the three-way means you have to have a bunch of spots where all three guys are, are doing a spot simultaneously. So the three fucking guys you choose, God bless the Pope. I, I actually, the Pope's fine. But Mr. fucking Anderson and Matt Morgan together in a three-way... Asking for trouble, which we got. Shitty match. It was a male three-way version of the finish of the previous match. It was rushed. Pope went for the double knees on Anderson. Anderson avoided it, hit the mic check, and then Morgan just booted Anderson and stole the pin. Yes, a man stole a pin in a TNA three-way. Mm-hmm. Next thing you know, some dude's going to be slamming a cage door in someone's head. And and you had the random... Uh I, I believe Morgan had been on a losing streak, and then he pinned Pope here. So, as usual in TNA, the mid, mid card just moves around a bit. No one ever gets over. We had Jeff Hardy in his uh, open challenge. As he came to the ring, Mike Tanay referred to this as a once-in-a-lifetime impact. Never again can they just do a bunch of matches. Yeah. Can't ever happen in our lifetimes. So, the mystery opponent was Shannon Moore. He came out and said he wanted to prove he stood on the same pedestal as Jeff, but promised they would leave his brothers. He was wearing a T-shirt from a new movie. They plugged the movie... I will say they plugged it violently. They plugged it uh, as unsubtly as they could. So, so, in the middle of this match, remember the moonsault body press I talked about Kurt hitting and how it was cool? Shannon hit the exact same thing here like an hour later. Of course. Way to go, agents. About a half hour later, actually. Yeah, so... I liked this match. It was, it was not it was, a great it was, match. It was a good match. It was fine. It was an above-average match. The finish was weird. Shannon tried to top rope Hurricane Rana. Jeff hung on and then hit the senton for the pin. And he actually stopped covering him at two. But the ref counted three anyway because yeah. Shannon's shoulders were down. Well, you know what? Great. And if this was, you know, we talk about this in, in, in on Raw all the time. Just count the finish. It's the finish. Just count it. We had Beer Money and the Machine Guns in match five of the best of five series in a best of three falls match. Mm-hmm. After they have done a cage match and a ladder match and a street fight in Ultimate X, they are now doing best two out of three. You know, many years ago I would have written, did I just write that? But now I know I just wrote that. Mm-hmm. The the final of the best of five was a best of three. It's like, I think it's stupider than a straight match <laughs> to me. me. Now, that's about as far as I'm going to go as far as, as critiquing this match, because this match was fucking great. Um, the only thing that annoyed me about it was the fans. They were they were so busy chanting "This is wrestling" and "Motor City" and "Match of the Year" that I'm not even sure they were watching the match. Yeah. So these guys had an awesome match. Heels won the first fall. Babyface won the second fall, and then the babyfaces won the third fall in the series. Today's going on and on about it being the best damn series in the history of wrestling. Maybe it was. All I know is that this was one of the best matches, maybe the best TNA TV match of the year. It was one of the best TNA matches of the year. Probably one of the best matches in, in wrestling, although it was a TV match. There were commercial breaks, and it well, was probably it was a little bit rushed. Actually, comical, because they were advertising throughout the show that it would be it would be nonstop action. There would be no rest period between falls. So they did the first fall. It was, pretty, it was an average match length, in fact, for an impact match longer than that. Then the second fall was very rushed. So then now the end of the third fall, and two minutes in, commercial break. That's why you have rest period between falls. I think that the I think the whole key to this thing to me is that this match was awesome. It was awesome. The fans were going apeshit for it, and this was the match where they just let them have a wrestling match. There were no fucking stipulations. There were no fucking cages or ladders or or cables or shit like that. They just let guys go out there and have a wrestling match, and it was the best of the five. 
Will they learn a goddamn thing from that? Of course not. The next pay-per-view is going to have 8 million stipulations. On a poll. Because that's what they do. Yes. But anyway, this match was awesome. Uh, big thumbs up to the Machine Guns. Big thumbs up to Beer Money. You guys are awesome. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry you work in such a shitty promotion. Indeed. They, they, this match went nearly 20 minutes, and I don't... And it was 20 minutes. It was one of the matches where it was 20 minutes of basically one giant long spot. And I don't, I don't think anything got fucked up. Yeah. E- or even done poorly. So, yes, it was, it was amazing. Then we had RVD and Abyss for the title. Bischoff as a referee in a match where the board covered in nails was hanging from the ceiling. Abyss actually tried to climb the ladder during RVD's intro. That yes. was funny. That was wise. I hated this match. God, this match. Just. I hated it. So they do this fucking match, and there's a ladder, there's a board with well, nails yeah, hanging it, from the ceiling. The, the gimmick is you can climb the ladder to get the board of nails and use it. All right, now let me get to this. Mm-hmm. There's fucking things hanging from the ceiling. So, of course, they hit each other with ladders, they hit each other with chairs, they use all sorts of fucking gimmicks, and finally, Abyss goes and gets his goodie bag. What is in it? Well, it's thumbtacks. And then he keeps pouring, and it's glass. So he goes to give RVD a move into it. But, of course, RVD... It was Superplex, actually. He was going to Superplex RVD into into thumbtacks and nails. So they're battling there, and RVD ends up fighting his way free. And then RVD does one of those top rope sunset flip power bombs, and Abyss falls into the tacks and the glass. That is how much time right there passed before Abyss was back on his feet, giving RVD a boot. Mm-hmm. They did not go for a cover. Nope. They did not sell. No. Abyss took a sunset flip power bomb into fucking tacks and glass, and ten seconds later, he was on his feet, giving RVD a boot. Right. So, right there, I'm like, well, fuck this match, and fuck you both. So then they keep going. Abyss now gets a board covered in barbed wire. Now, why the fuck would we care... He just took a fucking power bomb into glass and tacks, and now we're supposed to give a shit about a board covered in barbed wire? I don't give a fuck. So he sets up the board. Of course, RVD ain't stupid enough to go into this fucking board. Abyss goes into Abyss it. Abyss is stupid enough to go into the fucking board. Abyss goes into the board. RVD then then puts him in the corner. He puts the barbed wire board against him, and he goes to the other side of the ring to do the coast-to-coast dropkick. Now, let's picture this. Abyss is in the corner... A heap. There is a board covered in barbed wire leaning against him. RVD goes to the other side of the ring. He's going to do the the biggest drop kick of all time, coast to coast, and kick the board into Abyss's body. Well, then he gets a chair because you see he's going to do a coast to coast drop kick with a chair because doing a coast to coast drop kick and sending a barbed wire board into a man's face is not enough. It's much more dangerous if you use a chair into the board, into the barbed wire, into the man's face. God, this was fucking stupid. Uh-huh. So he does the move. Then he has a frog splash. He gets the pin. The most infuriating thing about this fucking match, besides just how stupidly it was put together, is they keep cutting to Dixie Carter. Right. Dixie is in the crowd with the Red Rooster. And they're both watching the battle and... I think she's supposed to be concerned. I'm not sure. Dixie Carter looks like a wax figurine. She looks like a cardboard cutout with a relief map attached to it for all of her features. She's standing out there. She has one look on her face, which is a blank look. When something violent happens, they cut to her. She's got the same look on her face. When RVD is doing some big move, they cut back to her, and she is clapping with the exact same look on her face. When Abyss does something dastardly or falls into into glass and tacks, they cut to Dixie. She's got the exact same goddamn look on her face. And finally, when the match is over and RVD is won, they cut to Dixie, who has the exact fucking same look on her face. And I might add, just jumping ahead... At the end of the show, all of Fortune goes nuts, 
and they attack the ECW guys or the EV2 guys, and Ric Flair comes out, and he's yelling and screaming at Dixie, and Dixie is standing there with the same fucking look on her face. I'm sure she's a wonderful woman. I'm sure she's really nice. In fact, I know she's nice. She's too nice. That's the problem. But for the love of fucking Christ, it would be one thing if Dixie Carter were a compelling television character. It would be one thing if Dixie Carter was the female version of the bombastic Vince McMahon. Instead, Instead, she's the anti-Tiffany. She's the anti-Tiffany. I never even knew such a thing was even possible to have an anti-Tiffany. I'm done. There, there was actually... I, I'm I, done, I, Gus. I, I will... There, there was one point where she actually cracked a smile. No. No, I, there was. We, I, I'll go back and check because, you see, it was after the match when Hulk Hogan was in the ring. That got a reaction out of her. Wow. She was happy to see the Hulkster. She didn't care about RVD and Abyss killing each other. So, uh, uh, some of these stupid stuff you miss, besides, yes, as noted, the multiple, repeated, countless, redundant, overdone shots of Terry Taylor and Dixie Carter being completely stoned and or bo- bored out of their minds. Wouldn't it be cheaper to just have Dixie, like, sell mops on TV and just buy infomercial time all around the country and she could have her face on TV every night selling yes. shit? Wouldn't that be, I know that would be cheaper. I know it. That would be so much fucking cheaper than running a wrestling promotion that's bleeding money and having them constantly cut to a shot of you in the crowd with the same fucking look on your face. Yeah, infomercials apparently make money because they keep making them. So then in this match in which they were climbing ladders to grab a barbed wire board and they were also using thumbtacks and glass and barbed wire, there's a point where Abyss went under the rain to get the barbed wire board and Eric Bischoff began to count him out. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, Abyss beat the count back into the ring. So, let's see, uh, Rob took a fantastically stupid bump off the ladder, off the top rope, to the floor. That's right, he almost hit, killed himself. Almost killed himself, and he said on the ladder. Choke slam off the ladder, that looked like it sucked. It was a choke slam off the ladder. And then, when Abyss finally got the stick, after all the, well, actually, but even before That's that. That's right. Even before that, though. If you can use tacks and a ladder and barbed wire, why bother with a stick? Why don't you just put a gun under the ring and shoot your opponent and pin him? Why not? But he didn't. After going through all these weapons, uh, RVD took the stupid bump to the floor, and Abyss climbed the ladder, and Abyss got the stick. And you know what Abyss did next? Let me guess. He put it down. You win a Cupid doll. <laughs> Abyss put the stick down. Yeah. And he he went, got it and put it down. Yeah, out of the ring to throw back, Rob back into the ring. I guess he couldn't hit Rob with the stick outside. No. So well, he might have got counted out. I guess so. So then they did the spot where Rob is cowering the corner, and Abyss swings the stick, and it. Rob dodges, and the stick gets stuck in the turnbuckle pad. Only, and I think this happened last time too, the nails fail to penetrate the turnbuckle, so it wasn't really stuck. Mm-hmm. So it bounced back, and then Abyss had to hold it in place as if it was stuck. Then he let go, and it fell out. What a rinky dink company. Yeah. So that was the match. It largely sucked. So then Hogan came out. He had had, he had throughout the show been promising Hulk Hogan's special announcement. His big surprise. His big surprise announcement, yes. So he came out, congratulated RVD, talked about how he had done on the pay-per-view or on the show. He mentioned the pay-per-view, he mentioned Sabu by name, and he struck Sabu's pose, and seeing Hulk Hogan do this actually made my body spasm. It was too weird to handle. He called Sabu the most dangerous man in the business. Yeah. The, uh... Put over the more dangerous than Abyss, for example. <laughs> yes. He uh, talked about how, uh, frankly, he, he talked. He did a great job of pushing the pay per view, encouraging us all to buy the replay. Uh, talked about how how great it had been, how what what great athletes they were. He uh, called out EV2, said they had showed him what Harker was all about, and he welcomed him, welcomed them to his ring, and then he left. So let at, me talk about Dreamer. All right, what does fucking Dreamer talk about? Why, of course, Dixie Carter. Yeah. Talks and talks. They keep cutting a Dixie. Same fucking look on her face. Talks about Dixie. The fans start chanting, thank you, Dixie. I swear to God, I'm going to vomit one of these days watching this show. I cannot remember the last time I vomited when I was not drunk. Actually, I can't remember the last time I vomited when I was drunk. Well, regardless, you were drunk. I'm going to vomit watching this fucking show soon. I can just tell. So he's ranting and raving, and suddenly the lights go out. And we're supposed to think it's Sandman, but instead... Lights come back on. Mick is down. Fortune is in the ring. They beat the crap out of everyone. Raven runs down. Where the fuck was Raven anyway? Mm. He was backstage doing whatever. He runs down. He gets hit. And then here comes Sandman. Where the fuck was he? He was just fucking around in the back, too. He was probably drunk. 
starts making his way through the crowd. It was actually great. He makes his entrance. He's being the same man, holding a stick up, going down the stairs, and he very slowly and awkwardly climbs over the guardrail, and he climbs the stairs to the ring. He then turns his back to the ring to pose to the fans, and then somebody took him out. Yeah. It was an amazing save. So the big problem with this was it started with like a dozen guys in the ring because they had all the EV2 crew out there. Then the lights came out, and they came back on. There was a half dozen more guys in the ring. I had no idea what was going on. There was, well, I, I'll tell you I what was going Morgan on. Morgan because he's enormous. I'll tell you what was going on. It was like, uh, you know, five Fortune guys being up everyone in EV2. Oh, okay. <laughs> As heels. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Awesome. And then Flair yelled at Dixie. Exact same look on her face. Show ended. Fuck Impact. So I'm just going to, in closing, steal Jeff Hamlin's line from the front page of the site. So when all was said and done, Hogan's big announcement was that the ECW guys were watching Van Dam's match in the back. Yeah, yes. that's what the announcement No, it was a big surprise. The surprise was that he'd gotten all the EV2 guys there to come out and celebrate with RVD afterwards. So it's a good fucking thing he won. Hogan just has faith in the man. Yeah, this show, watch the Machine Guns match. Other than that, show blue. To the back! All right, start on Impact here. Impact opened with what we were told was moments before. 30 minutes before, exactly. Yeah. Abyss and Jeff Hardy were having a brawl. Fans were walking into the building. They brawled backstage. They brawled down to the ring. They brawled hither and yon. People were walking in, standing, looking at them. They kept showing security and, like, TV geeks looking at them and not doing anything. Meanwhile, on audio, we had Tanae and Taz trying to get their equipment ready. They were bitching about cords. Something was plugged in wrong. Tanae's monitor was not working. Jeff Hardy's ass was hanging out. <laughs> there are not bigger fish to fry than a goddamn corn in the way at this moment. And then it went on and on and on and on. There was a shot where the cameraman followed them down to the ramp, and uh, they, they were brawling like, down the entrance ramp, next, entrance ramp next to the ring. The cameraman followed, and from that angle, if you look around, you could really see how small and pathetic the impact zone really is. It looks rinky-dink. So people continue to just enter and look, and then they... Brawled back outside, and uh, I don't know how it ended. It went like it, I know it ended. Gunner and Murphy broke it up. I see. Yeah, Gunner and Murphy are back. It went five minutes. Gunner and Murphy played no further role in the show. No, they they were wrestlers a couple of weeks ago. Now they're back to being security geeks that can break up a fight between Abyss and Jeff Hardy when no one else on the goddamn planet can. Did they ever actually do a match? Yeah. Okay, I missed that show. Remember Gunner and Murphy? There I know you saw this There were some shows I missed. Oh, no, actually, mm-hmm. Lance watched it with me. Yeah, okay. Anyway, the it point sucked. is... It went forever. Nobody figured out that this segment sucked. No one realizes how rinky-dink your promotion looks when two guys brawl for five straight minutes and nobody does anything. It wasn't even like, it wasn't even like in, in Japan when Abdul the Butcher went through the crowd and people ran for their lives. No, no. These people, people are looked coming on in... Like they did, could not possibly care less. It was two more freaks of the carnival. Yeah. So, Bischoff came out. He said last week's attack was the worst thing he'd ever seen, I'll say. He said Rob Van Dam was held together by stitches, staples, and pins. He had 117 stitches. They feared he had numerous punctured organs. They were unclear about the condition of his spinal cord, and they were worried he may have head trauma. Yeah. It's been a week. Mm-hmm. Seven days. And they still haven't diagnosed head trauma and possible <laughs> spinal cord injury. <laughs> Don't get hurt in Orlando, everyone. Well, that's for fucking Their sure. doctors apparently suck. Don't even go to Orlando. So, Eric let Rob know he would always have a home in TNA, and he said they were going to vacate the title. How wonderful. And do a tournament. Now, that's, a, that's a terrible thing to tell somebody when they're in critical condition. You'll always have a home in TNA. Don't worry. <laughs> I'd fucking die. <laughs> Just stay here in the hospital. So, we had an eight-man tournament starting right now. Rob Terry versus Jeff Hardy. Jeff's ass was still hanging out. I don't know if these guys are in the top ten. I don't care. But I presume, in fact, by the end of this night, I'm sure there were top ten guys who were not in the tournament for no reason. No. We're even listening to this show. Eric came out and he explained that they had to strip the title of they had to strip the title off of RVD because he may never be back. He said that they had to make a decision about what to do. And so tonight, the show must go on. They were vacating the title. The eight top contenders are involved in a tournament, see. and the tournament is going to finish at Bound for Glory. Yes. Well, that really doesn't change a rant I will have later. 
So here they had a three minute match. It was pretty bad. Jeff won with a sentence of death, but it was Rob Terry's fault for being too far away. Fortune arrived. The show and the world title tournament started without them. That made me laugh. We had a clip of Hulk Hogan on the phone outside the building. He was so angry about what had happened to Rob Van Dam and how they stood the title of him that he might quit the company. Yeah. We had our next tournament match. It was Jay Lethal versus Ken Anderson. He said he might quit. He was thinking about it. I did not sign up for this, he said. Yeah. He said he tried to build the entire company around RVD, and now they were going to strip of the title and do a tournament? Bullshit, he said. He said Abyss doing this was like trying to kill the president, as we said, and said, I'm thinking about just quitting. I'm done. I cannot take this anymore. At which point they began the Jay Lethal Mr. Anderson match, and the announcers had pretty much absolutely nothing to say about Hulk Hogan just threatening to quit total nonstop action. Yeah. This is why this show sucks, everybody. This is why nobody cares about this fucking show. Because Hulk Hogan threatened to quit TNA, and the announcers didn't make any fucking mention of it whatsoever. So we had Jay Lethal versus Ken, Ken Anderson. The wrong man won here by leaps and bounds. It would be impossible to watch this match and believe that Ken Anderson was a better wrestler than Jay Lethal. Jay looked awesome. Anderson could not keep up with him. He was falling down, taking arm drags and stuff. And then Anderson took over and he applied a perfectly stationary chin lock. And then, of course, he went on to win. Wrong man won here. Jay Lethal now 0-3 after beating Ric Flair. Amazing. Way to go, TNA. All right. We had a promo with Anthony and Love. We were told... I wrote, Velvet had a rematch clause and is using it tonight, or Madison or something. I have no idea what the recent history of this belt is or why Angelina says she had to give it back last time. But she said she would have a backup for the bodyguard. You don't remember why she had to give it back? She wanted a match, and it was like the, the wrong person got DQ'd. Is that right? No, they but, had a match, and if Velvet interfered or whoever interfered. Yeah, okay, it was the biker chick. The biker chick interfered yes. and the ref didn't check to see who the biker chick was. Yes, so she okay. gave the belt and then Madison had to give it back. Okay, I remember that now. I, I just remember the time the title changed hands because it was, it was in the wrong box. Yes. That's the that was also stupid. Yes. So this is why I don't care about the title. I choose. I'm happy I don't know what's going on with this belt anymore. We had a machine guns promo. They talked about how hard it, they had to fight to win the belts and uh, they talked about the series they just had with the beer money. They said that they brought the best out of each other. And uh, Shelly said they were heroes for Detroit and heroes for all the fans. And Saban said, heroes for all our fans. We love you guys. And it ended. Yeah. Money. This was awesome. We had Angelina versus Madison. Madison had the biker chick with her. Angelina had a velvet sky. All four girls brawled. <laughs> Very was, nonchalant about this. I don't care. Everybody. I don't care about any of this. Velvet Sky and Angelina are now officially back together as the beautiful people. This was their first time reuniting on this show since they broke up about a year ago. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, there was botched interference. Angelina won, so she is still champ. And uh, then she and Velvet celebrated. And then, I guess they're the heels, Madison and Biker Chick. I really don't know. But they attacked them both and laid them out, and that was that. Yes, Madison and the Biker Chick are heels. Okay, I'll take your word for it. We had Fortune come out. Flair was doing a promo, praising all of them. It's uh, At this point, it's AJ Styles, Frankie Kazarian, Doug Williams, Beer Money, and Matt Morgan. He put them all over, talked about how great they were. Called EV2 a circus act. A bunch of undisciplined animals said they made him sick. Said they did not belong in the business. The marquee says pro wrestling, not garbage cans, not kendo sticks, not tables. He said, we can all do that. I can crash in an airplane until you crash in an airplane. Kiss my ass. This was awesome. AJ said he was TNA. So this was the house that he built when who should come out to rebut but Dixie Carter. She said he may have built it, but she owns it. Somebody had the idea of, let's have Ric Flair cut a fucking promo where he talks about how these guys all suck. They're garbage wrestlers. They... Do shit that any fan can do. He's Ric Flair. He went down in a fucking airplane, and he's walking around and talking about it. Then he has to be followed by AJ Styles. Now, yeah. granted, AJ did a fine job. AJ's promos have gotten a lot better. Talked about how this was the house that AJ built, that sort of thing. So then, who do these two guys... Who has to follow these two guys? Dixie Carter. Right. 
Dixie Carter coming down the aisle, first off, almost made me vom. Then she starts talking did about you how... vom? Yes, I did. Okay. AJ might have built the house, but she owns it. She said it's my house, and therefore it's their house. She said that Hogan and Eric had warned her about Flair. She'd given him the benefit of the doubt. She said if people thought they'd seen the last of the ECW guys at Hardcore Justice, they were wrong. She said that she'd signed them all to contracts. Blah, 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 blah. All I know is this was another one of those fucking shows where... We have Dixie Carter talking about how she's the owner. We have Jeff Jarrett talking about how he's the founder. We've got all of this bullshit. And then we have Foley coming out and doing this fucking promo. God, this promo sucked. His delivery was fine. And now Foley's going to be mad at me. But Foley comes out and he, he starts ranting about how he called Ric Flair on such and such a day some sort of Inside reference to calling Flair, and he's taking credit for Flair signing with TNA, but now he regrets that. It's all this stuff that nobody has any idea what the fuck he's talking about. I don't even know what he's talking about, and I'm fucking, I do this for a living. So imagine the fans ranting and raving about mystery phone calls and this and that. And finally, then Dreamer starts talking about all of this bullshit. And they all love AJ until last week. And then he announces that him and AJ are going to wrestle tonight. So I guess Tommy is a booker. Now I've got a booker, an owner, and a founder. All in this fucking show at the same time. This sucks. Flair saved this segment. Flair was really awesome If it were not for Ric Flair and AJ Styles, this would have been the worst segment ever. (laughs) That's probably true. I also liked it when Dreamer threatened Flair. And Flair responded by falling to his back and kicking his feet in mock laughter. Yeah, they have his, that was great. Uh, they announced that all the EV2 guys now have contracts. They're all in TNA, including Sandman. Mm-hmm. That, that made me happy. Who fucking cares about a conversation Mick Foley had with Ric Flair over the phone that none of us saw at least a year, a year ago. ago? Yeah. I mean, who fucking could possibly care? No one. No one in the world could possibly care about this thing they know nothing about. It's the biggest problem with TNA is all of this insider bullshit. It's bullshit. They're talking about shit that's not on their show. Yes. So if you watch the show, you have no idea what they're talking about. It's not even like, it's one thing if you talk about shit that's not on your show. But, you know, it's bad enough when they talk about something in WWE. Or they talk about something from the 90s. Or they talk about something from the 80s. That's bad enough, okay? But at least you're talking about shit that people actually remember. Now it's like you're making shit up. This is like when they did that that thing years ago where, like, it was like AJ had kids or or his dad was mean to him or some such bullshit. Who cares? How could we possibly care about this stuff? It's like you're just making it up as you go along. People don't care about that. People don't care about stories you make up as you go along, even if they actually happen. None of us saw it. You're making it up as it goes along. None of it's us, impossible to care. Not only did I see it, none of us knew about it until right now. No. Yeah, so we can't care about it. Yeah. We had a little promo with Kurt Angle. He talked about his match with Doug Williams. So he was halfway through the top ten. Said he had been doing one night tournaments since high school, and now he was three wins away from regaining the title. Then we had the best thing on this show ever. Kurt Angle versus Doug Williams. This was awesome. It, the best six minute match you'll ever see. It just ruled. I wish these guys, if these guys wrestle on TV every single week, I'd never make fun of Impact again. They went out there, they had an awesome, fucking great match. All action, great near falls, even Taz was marking out. Yeah. Williams goes for the Chaos Theory suplex, Kurt blocks it, puts on the ankle lock, leg scissor, submission. This was just great. This, this, I will give this show a thumbs up because no, of this match alone. That's not unreasonable. Yeah. That's not, I, I, I've been complaining about, uh, for example, Drew McIntyre wrestling Matt Hardy a million times. Doug Williams and Kurt Angle have my permission to have a best of one million series starting right now. I'd be fine with that. We had a little Mr. Anderson promo. He was happy about his win, but mostly he was sad about RVD being apparently dead. Then we had a, a promo that actually, this made me more mad than the Ric Flair Dixie Carter thing earlier. Sting and Kevin Nash came out. Nash said there was nobody he respected more than Sting. Said after 20 years and dozens of knee operations, he was not just out there for the money. He was there because he loved this business. He was damned if somebody was going to tell him it was his time to step aside. And the fans all went, yay! I don't think that was the intent. He threatened to reveal the truth about Jeff Jarrett or and Hogan, what was going on when Jarrett interrupted. Jarrett threatened to talk about 
all of Sting's skeletons. No one gives a fuck. He said, you know what I'm talking about. No one cares. No, no I don't. None of the fans know what you're talking about. We don't have a clue what Sting's skeletons are. He said the locker room was sick of the games. What games? The crowd was getting quieter and more confused with each sentence. He announced that for Bischoff and Hogan and everything they had done for this company, he was going to grab a chair and beat their asses. Then Hogan, who earlier had threatened to quit, had been overhearing all this. He came out to join him. He told Nash and Sting they were just jealous of the young guys. He dared Sting to dump the bat. Sting was fine with this. Sting had no problem in dumping his bat and having a fair fight. So then before the light, before the fight could start, the lights went out. Fortune was killing all four of them. The fans were still confused. This segment accomplished less than nothing. Wow, we're really excited to see Hogan and Jarrett and Nash and Sting against the old ECW guys. Or Even Crumbly cannot be excited for this. Who could possibly care about that feud? That sounds horrible. <laughs> that does not sound good. I don't know. It's, I guess it would be Flair. It would be Fortune against, against ECW and... Yeah. Yeah. So, Even so, I got confused. So Fortune apparently fighting, uh, fighting would that be six on ten or something? Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so we awesome. had them. We've got the heels badly outnumbered in this feud. Way yeah. to go, TNA. So we got all the ECW guys backstage. Raven and Tommy Dreamer were being chummy. Yeah, they're friends now. After, after their big again. match at Hardcore Justice. They're they, pals. They, they wrap barbed wire around each other's faces. He Dreamer told Raven not to be a rebel. The point of this promo was they can't believe how unbelievably great Dixie Carter is. That's all they wanted to talk about. All they, all she had done for them. All they owed her. This, this made me vom. <laughs> so depressing. We had a title tournament match of uh, Matt Morgan versus the Pope. Sucked. Indeed, it did. At least the right man won here, though. Pope pinned Morgan in about three minutes. So again, way to make your world title tournament important by having your first round over in less than twenty minutes combined. Hardy and Angle. Or Hardy versus Angle and they, Anderson versus Pope. Those they put were the up brackets. brackets that w- made it impossible to comfort. You knew who the four guys were left, but it was impossible to read these until the matchups were. So thankfully, today told us yes. Angle versus Hardy and Anderson versus Pope. We had a brief Mick Foley promo saying he would be either courageous or stupid. Courageous if he took time off, or stupid if he didn't. But he was EV 2.0 all the way. Why does Mick Foley need to take time off? I guess because of the way they beat him up at the end of the... Didn't they beat everybody up? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. He's old. I guess so. Old and fat, yeah. So we had our main event of AJ Styles versus Tommy Dreamer in a not dream match. It was what it was. (laughs) It was nothing much to it. The factions all brawled. Fortune came down the ring. ECW guys jumped him from the side. Abyss had apparently been hiding under the ring for two hours. He... Rolled into the ring, hit Tommy Dreamer with a back, black hole slam. <laughs> we talk about how things happen in front of the ref all the time, and it, and it irritates us. The ref had his back turned here, but he did not hear a 350-pound man creeping into the ring. Of course not. And laying out Tommy Dreamer, 500 pounds of flat hitting the canvas. This it, is not. It's even better. It's even better. Rest. It's stupid enough when you have a normal match in TNA, and the referee does, and the referee's looking right at interference and doesn't call for a DQ. In this one, they went out of their way to distract the referee, and and he had to pretend like he could not hear a 350-pound man giving a 300-pound man a black hole slam. But on top of all that, did Tommy Dreamer not, at the beginning of the show, said this would be an extreme match, and they brawled for about five minutes outside the ring when this thing started? Also true. <laughs> you really had to fucking distract the referee in this goddamn match? Yes. This place, this people cannot do anything right. So then this match ended. Tommy Dreamer pinned AJ Styles won. And here is where it occurred to me that AJ Styles is not in the title tourney. So I guess he's not in his top eight, but he's the TV champion. And there's eight guys ranked higher than him. Mm-hmm. Has, has he been on a losing streak? That I, I may have missed it. You know, I may have missed his losing streak where he retained the belt Honky Tonk Man style, losing by DQ over and over again. But... It sure seemed dumb that he... He is ranked lower than Matt Morgan, for example. Yes, that's dumb. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, he's, Matt Morgan is ranked higher than AJ Styles here. He's the TV champion. This, he is this is why 10. this show sucks. Who but, cares? even though he is not in the tournament, he still gets the main event spot, and he gets the most time. Yeah. Yes. That's it's, Impact dumb. sucks. It does. Impact is the worst, the most horribly written show I've ever seen in my life. You're right. They have no idea what they're doing. They don't. 
That's why no one watches the show. That's why no one buys the pay-per-view. But, it's, it's, That's but, why this but, but we still have to review it. It's a failure. We do still have to review it. So that's what I did. It's on national television. All right, let me play this comedy. 